So more reading on the bluegrass conspiracy. I'm not sure if the cartoon will pick any of those words up, but by Sally didn't. Alright, so we're at the um, funeral uh, of Andrew Carton Thornton. Drew Thornton. Uh, sadistic psychopath out of Lexington. Uh, murderous, revengeful, drug smuggler. Um, so... Uh, the police were all there uh, at the funeral. The horse breeders, gamblers, convicts, a lot of a lot of people. Huge funeral. They're all paying their last respects to Drew Thornton, uh, all American boy. Uh, cocaine commando spawned by the upper crust serenity and refinement of the genteel South. A member of the Elvis Presley generation. A cocaine commando. It's Drew Car uh, Carter Thornton. Drew Thornton was very fond of the words of the original philosopher who said, Man can overcome any obstacle if he knows in his heart that he must, and in his mind that he shall. The Reverend Cliff Pike of the tiny Episcopal Church in Paris, Kentucky, said in his eulogy, Perhaps more than anyone, Thornton would have appreciated the absurdity of his death. He thought of himself as a purist, an innocent, said Betty Zaring, Thornton's former wife. Over lunch the previous summer, Betty had asked Thornton how he justified the violence, the paradoxes of his life. Thornton had replied that he meditated regular, regularly, at which time he entered a world beyond good and evil. He told his ex-wife that he was a hero of a hero consciousness, that at another time in history he would have been a Genghis Khan, a ninja or a samurai, a valorous paragon of battle. He believed he was an impeccable warrior, said Zaring, referring to Carlos Castaneda's term. He was a philosophical, incredibly disciplined, extremely spiritual, and loyal warrior with his own code of ethics, who thrived on excitement. Others who knew him, Drew Thornton, do not share this romantic, romanticized version. They say that Drew Thornton thrived on vengeance, uh, violence, and murder. So, here's the part where John Y. Brown Jr., uh, a, a former governor of Kentucky, I think, uh, current owner of Yum. Brands, I should check that out. Uh, I've repeated it twice, so I should definitely check out John Y. Brown Jr. And I'll say it next video. So John Y. Brown Jr. was definitely the governor of Kentucky. So the governor, ex-governor of Kentucky. So, all right. So Ralph Ross, the guy who's his nemesis, Drew Thornton's nemesis, was one, uh, but one of thousands of viewers who watched with all his details of the Lexington millionaire's secret life were unveiled. So the, this involved a lot of the millionaires in Lexington, the rich, the elite, the owners of our uh, class-based society. Among the items and documents that rolled across the television screen were internal criminal justice department memoranda signed by Neil Welch. Lambert's telephone toll records, uh, records that reflected calls to Brown and First, uh, John Y. Brown Jr. and First Lady Phyllis George. Flight records that revealed Lambert had accompanied Brown as a state owned, on a state-owned helicopter to the racetrack. Lambert's personal address book, which referred to Brown and his wife as Magoo and P.G. Magoo. So <laughs> John White Brown's called Magoo and P.G. Magoo and the wife. So they are using code names uh, to contact each other. Confidential FBI reports stating that Lambert had been the target of a pros prostitution, corruption, murder, extortion and narcotics investigation since 1979. So, Lambert. Lambert. Who's this Lambert guy? Lambert. Some Somebody, I guess, that's getting the, the, the heat at the trial. And uh, who's connected to the case uh, of Drew Thornton and connected to the governor. So... Uh, information about Lambert's initial refusal to take a polygraph in connection with the disappearance and death of Rebecca Moore. So Lambert's a, 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 a shitty guy. He's under investigation for murdering Rebecca Moore. Uh, uh, and he was a, been a target of a prostitution, corruption, murder, extortion, and narcotics investigation since 1979. He's also, you know, involved in underground. Uh, 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 using Magoo and PG Magoo as names for the governor, so he's using underground language uh, to cover up what he is doing. Also shown was a check stub indicating a payment from Lambert to Brown referencing partnership interest in Trump's. 
the Cincinnati nightclub in which John Y. Brown had denied involvement. That stub would prompt the IRS to question why the asset had never been declared as income by Brown. Brown counted that he had loaned Lambert $30,000 to buy the club, but Trump's landlords contradicted Brown's claims and said they considered Brown to be the owner and responsible party for any debts incurred by the business. <laughs> so... Kind of like Mitt Romney saying that he wasn't involved in Bain Capital in those years when he lied on his uh, uh, income tax reports, which is a felony. And uh, they're, I guess they are pursuing uh, legal action on that, the Obama campaign, uh, which would be interesting to see how that actually uh, pans out because um, he probably did lie because uh, uh, he was the, you know, they didn't say he had any interest, but he was the CEO, so he's the boss, <laughs> the main boss. He was one of the board of trustees, and he was, uh, I don't know, he was a bunch of uh, high levels of uh, uh, official status in Bain Capital. So, uh, John Y. Brown then de denied the involvement, and uh, but the Trump's landlords uh, contradicted Brown's claims. Ralph watched the explosive broadcast with a mixture of satisfaction and yearning. In a small way, he felt vindicated by the imminent arrest of Lambert and the devastating embarrassment of John Y. Brown Jr., but still he had a hunger for more. He wondered if he had the stamina and patience to await what he believed would be the inevitable dem demise of Drew Thornton and Henry Vance. The raids on Lambert's house houses threw John Y. Brown Jr. into a quandary. Though Lambert remained in Europe, it was but a matter of time before he'd be indicted on criminal charges. At a hastily called press conference, similar to a one a week earlier in which he announced Welch's firing, Brown again lashed out against the television station uh, WKYT. I think what has happened in Lexington makes the movie Absence of Malice, which I, I'm not sure about that, but what that movie is, but the Absence of Malice look like puffball. So he's saying what happened in Lexington is like an action-packed Hollywood movie, uh, and not like some, I guess, I don't know, uh, uh, kid movie. Brown defended his 25-year friendship with Lambert and claimed never to have seen Jimmy do anything illegal. Brown stated further that he'd never even seen cocaine. Questioned by reporters about rumors that Lambert was the governor's bookie, Brown responded, Jimmy likes to bet on everything. He bets on everything that walks, talks, or wiggles, everything but wrestling matches. So you can use your own imagination if Jimmy and I ever bet each other. So he didn't answer whether or not they, they bet each other. So yeah, yeah, he bet with them. He's a gambler, even though gambling's illegal in Kentucky, and it's not coming up for ballot. We don't even have the choice on our ballot. They said that we were going to have a choice, so I guess we'll see. We'll find out if it gets on the ballot or not. Uh, it's July, so we got like four or five months for the November election, which is going to have a higher turnout rate than the 12 percent. So maybe maybe 14 percent of Kentuckians might come out uh, and engage in their democracy. Hopefully more. Hopefully more. Uh, Hunter S. Thompson had a, uh, a cool quote about coming from a long generation of warriors and uh, rabble rousers and rebels and misfits and freedom fighters and, uh, uh, I guess, rogues and individuals. So uh, I'll get that quote also. John Y. Brown and Hunter S. Thompson quote coming up next video. Okay. Maybe I should write that down. Uh, now nah, I remember. Okay. Uh, fortunately for John Y. Brown, little significance was attached to the Lambert raid by either the Lexington Herald or the Louisville Courier Journal, the state's two most influential daily newspapers, except for reporting on the initial raid, which neither followed up with any in-depth uh, uh, stories. So the main daily for Lexington and for Louisville did not cover the connection of Lambert to John Y. Brown in the Drew Thornton cocaine uh, debacle. Fortunately for Brown, little significance was attached to Lambert, uh, uh, the Lambert raid by either Lexington Herald or the Louisville Courier Cour Journal, uh, the state's two most influential daily newspapers. Except for reporting on the initial raid, neither followed up with any in-depth stories. The problem then for both Brown and Lambert appeared to be the reports on WKYT, the subsidiary corporations of Kentucky Central Bank and Kentucky Central Insurance Company. WKYT fell under the cloak of state-regulated industries, and therefore particularly susceptible to political pressure. Lexington's nobility was also united in its disapproval of such investigative type journalism. Though it's, it is said that no official social register exists, it is no secret that the state is controlled by those of high descent, the invisible names etched on the non-existent register. Lexington's aristocrats rising to Lambert's defense snubbed federal, federal prosecutors, 
uh, and their wives. The posh country clubs and service organizations known for their snobbishness blackballed anyone associated with the government side of the probe. None of the enclaves is more exclusive than the Idle Hour, Idle Hour Country Club, whose restrictive policies are discussed in hushed tones so as to avoid publicity about the racist and anti-Semitic policies that are still pervasive a quarter of a century after the passage of civil rights legislation. With, when idle, with Idle Hour as the unchallenged benchmark, other organizations followed suit. So the families of federal agents faced censure from a host of social events. So it was uh, deeply embedded. Drew Thornton was deeply embedded in state politics, had friends in lots of high places. He was uh, an aristocrat, so he was right there, I guess, in the middle of the owner class in Lexington. In a state where politicians are often considered bought and paid for puppets, holding public office has never guaranteed social stature, but Brown's daddy had been somebody, so the governor had made the grade. So that's the connection of Drew Thornton uh, and Governor John Y. Brown. There's more details, so definitely read you know all the other spaces that I'm not reading. Okay, so drug agents continued their multi-state search for the remainder of Drew's cocaine shipment for several weeks, but they weren't the only ones engaged in the treasure hunt. Forest Service officials reported record numbers of hikers combing the Chattahoochee Forest, pilots in private airplanes. <laughs> So lots of random people are going out looking for all this cocaine in Tennessee and uh, Georgia forest. Pilots in private airplanes used binoculars to scout the rugged countryside. A 200-pound bear, black bear, discovered one of the duffel bags and died of an overdose after burying his face in the powder. In Cherokee County, Georgia, north of Atlanta, a parachute with its straps cut was found in a residential backyard that was adjacent to a vacant field. Neighbors remembered a maroon car that was parked nearby on the night of Drew's last jump. So there's a maroon car that was parked nearby on the night of Drew's last jump. The car uh, that was traced, that car was traced to David Cowboy Williams who had been a member of Drew's offload crew who was to be responsible for driving the 900 pounds of cocaine from Knoxville to the stash house in Daytona, Florida, where it would be turned over to the Colombians distributors. So uh, 900 pounds of cocaine from Knoxville to the stash house in Daytona, Florida. So uh, Cowboy, David Cowboy Williams was the man, the middleman. He was one of the main middlemans in Drew Thornton's operation. Drew Thornton was going to go to Knoxville, Tennessee, uh, meet up with his girlfriend uh, at a hotel, undisclosed hotel, and then they were going to give the cocaine to David Cowboy Williams uh, out of Boone County, uh, Kentucky. David uh, Cowboy Williams uh, was to take the cocaine from Drew Thornton at Knoxville, Tennessee, and take it down to Florida. So that's another state. There's four states so far that's been mentioned in this multi-state operation. You have Georgia, uh, Tennessee, Florida, and North Carolina. Uh, North Carolina is where the um, Cessna 404 had crashed a plane. Um, and interesting that he did wear Gucci shoes. Uh, Drew Thornton had Gucci shoes on, so either he was really a cool gangster who could wear and fly planes and be involved in drug smuggling uh, with loafers on, or some some other weird stuff is going on here. So this is a bluegrass conspiracy, man. <laughs> this is enticing. Okay, so uh, David Cowboy Williams. Uh, but like so many others whose paths intersected with Drew Thornton, the owner of the maroon Mercedes-Benz, which with the vanity plate that read Sky Dive, uh, D-I-V, S-K-Y-D-I-V, just six letters, would not live long enough to provide clues. So even though he was the middle drug runner from Knoxville, Tennessee to uh, Daytona, Florida, so since he was the... Uh, uh, the night runner, or the uh, the middle middle runner, the truck runner, uh, I guess the vanity, uh, uh, Mercedes-Benz runner, a skydiver, Mercedes-Benz middle runner, uh, he ends up dying. So at noon on September 29th, 1985, the uh, same year as my sister was born, the cowboy was doing what he did every weekend. He boarded himself, a pilot and 15 recreational skydivers into his commercial Cessna 208 caravan. Operating out of the West Wind Sport Parachute Club, a remote landing strip located three miles from the kitchens 
farm in Jenkins, Georgia. Uh, we'll find out more next. All right. <laughs>